you know this is the new you know not really new but this is something that is that become the standard of care over the past several years and um, in our country we are still kind of not uh, equipped in a uniform basis to be offering this um, procedure but i think it's a great procedure in terms of what it can do to reduce morbidity uh, in terms of uh, lymphedema shoulder dysfunction and paresthesia numbness and all that so i'll just cover my topic in, in this manner as anatomy of and then uh, the ncc and tnm staging just quickly grow, uh, go over it because i'm sure you know the ncc and tnm staging and all that uh, the history of how sentinel lymph node came to uh, breast and where it started and who are the patients who are eligible for this procedure the indications or criteria for sentinel node biopsy uh, the procedure and uh, i will uh, also show you um, some of the uh, prospective randomized clinical trials which led to central node biopsy being adopted as a standard of care and i'll leave you with some food for thought also because uh, you know central node biopsy is not as well established in the new adjuvant chemotherapy setting but it is slowly finding its way there too a lot of places it is the standard of care but uh, in our country where you see large tumors um, it is taking time before we because we have to validate our findings with our patients before we adopt it as standard of care so you must be aware of what the axillary anatomy is to be able to understand how is it that the breast drains to the various levels of lymph nodes whenever we talk in terms of breast cancer and the axilla the axillary nodes are uh, you know designated as level 1 2 or 3 in relation to the pectoralis minor muscle so there are various groups of lymph nodes so you know that's the uh, lateral uh, group of lymph node which lies lateral to the pec, uh, the axillary vein and posterior to it and at the uh, anatomic confluence of the axillary vein with the latissimus dorsi so those are the lateral axillary nodes so then the other one is the posterior subscapular lymph nodes which are these ones which is the posterior wall of the axilla and it also corresponds to the lateral border of the scapula and it is contiguous with the subscapular vessels and then you have these which are along the lateral border of the pectoralis minor which is the anterior or the pectoral group so all these green nodes are the ones which constitute the level 1 lymph nodes then you come to level 2 which is behind the pectoralis minor and all these preceding nodal groups they drain uh, into these uh, nodes or there it gets a direct drainage from the breast parenchyma also and it is centrally located between the anterior and posterior axillary folds and then when you talk of the uh, the uh, uh, apical or the sub subclavicular region or the infraclavicular at the apex of the axilla along the medial aspect of the vein and medial to the pectoralis minor is the uh, level 3 lymph node and then of course uh, for surgeons there is a third a sixth group of lymph node which is the interpectoral lymph nodes which is also known as the rotters lymph nodes and this lies between the pectoralis major and minor and it runs along the pectoralis pectoralis uh, pectoral branches which arises from the thoracoacromial vessels so this is again showing the same thing uh, so these are level 1 level 2 behind this and the level 3 lymph nodes and then of course uh, don't forget the internal mammary nodes also because we will be talking about it uh, while we're talking of uh, lymph of the lymph nodal drainage so most of the lymph, the uh, the maximum number of uh, lymph nodes to which the breast drains is the axillary nodes but in 5% of cases you will get internal mammary node positivity also So it is the uh, British surgeon uh, W M uh, Samson Handley who is credited with the recognition of the spread of breast cancer to the internal mammary uh, nodes as a primary route of uh, systematic uh, systemic dissemination, and the inter internal mammary nodes, as I showed you earlier, lies within the intercostal spaces in the parasternal region, and the nodes lie close to the internal mammary artery in the extra pleural fat. so the nodes uh, there are various percentages as you would see as to how many uh, how do you see the first space may have about 97% uh, of lymph nodes then in the second space also 98% of times you'll find lymph nodes 
third space also, it's quite a high percentage of lymph nodes in the first two to three spaces. And then it falls and then again, it picks up when it comes to the sixth intercostal space. This is the prevalence of nodes in each intercostal space. So how do the lymphatic uh, flow happens? How does the lymphatic space uh, flow happens? It goes from the uh, subepithelial or the papillary plexus of lymphatics of the breast, and it communicates with the subdermal lymphatics, and then it merges with the subareolar uh, plexus of SAPI. So the subareolar plexus receives vessels from both the nipple and areola, and it communicates by means of vertical lymphatic uh, channels. So there is a unidirectional flow from superior to the deep plexus and from the subareolar plexus through the lymphatic vessels along the ducts to the perilobular and deep subcutaneous plexus. And from the deep subcutaneous and the intramammary vessels, it moves centrifugally to the axillary and the internal mammary nodes. So that's how the flow happens. So in the presence of nodal metastasis, so there can be obstruction to the lymphatic flow and you can open up alternative channels. So the alternative routes could be deep, it could be substernal, there could be a cross uh, drainage to the opposite uh, internal mammary chain, or there could be a pre-sternal crossover. So there can be a whole lot of uh, crossovers that happen with uh, lymph nodes. So this is the same thing just to show you how it can cross over from, uh, from one side to the other and, to, and adopt various other uh, routes as well. So this is just to run through the uh, staging of the breast cancer. This is the T stage, you all are aware of it. But what we are going to focus is on the uh, nodal status. So you, you have to look at the clinical nodal status and then you should be aware of the pathological nodal status also. And don't forget the two Bs and the three Bs. So the two B, the moment you have a two B or a three B, you know we are talking about internal mammary nodes. But when, when we say two B, it is only internal mammary nodes without axillary nodal involvement. And the same goes for pathological staging also. But when we say 3B, it is both internal mammary and axillary lymph nodes. So that is what you should keep in mind. So uh, like I said, and when we say N1, just for a brief understanding of the whole thing, when we say N1, it is level one and two movable lymph nodes. When we say N2A, it is a level one or two fixed. When we say N2B, it is internal mammary alone. N3A is infraclavicular. N3B, I've already told you, is internal mammary with the axillary. And when we say N3C, it is the supraclavicular lymph node. So that's what you need to keep in mind. So now let's come to the sentinel node history. So the term sentinel node was coined by Gold in uh, 1960 in reference to a neck radical neck dissection during parotidectomy. In 1970, so Ket is the one who uh, demonstrated the sorgius node and it usually received drainage from the breast first before it progressed through the remaining axillary nodes. However, it was Cabanas who, who uh, discovered the central node in relation to a penile carcinoma. So this is based on lymphagiograms on more than 100 patients where he called the first draining lymph node as the sentinel lymph node. And in the late 1980s, you had Morton who uh, proposed the innovative concept of lymphatic mapping with melanoma. So when it came to the breast, it was Armando Giuliano from the John Wayne Institute who proposed the concept that sentinel node could be localized in breast cancer also. And that the sentinel node was actually predictive of the axillary nodal status. And he said that this is a procedure which gives you the information that you want without subjecting the patient to the morbidity that otherwise we see. So, uh, like I said, Morton said that the first sentinel node was the sentinel node was the first node which received afferent lymphatic channels from the primary tumor. So, a uh, sentinel lymph node is the first node or a group of nodes to which a lymph no lymph uh, drainage happens and metastasis occurs from the primary tumor. It is usually the axillary node. Sentinel node is usually axillary. Rarely, it can be seen in non-axillary locations, like we said. The, no, uh, the internal mammary nodes. So, uh, so we have to identify you know, patient selection criteria. You can see failure in identifying or localizing the sentinel lymph node. And the, uh, the uh, significant 
uh, criteria where they failed to identify lymph node was body mass index if it was more than 30 uh, or more than 50 you know you failed more times and more than 70 age more than 70 again you were likely to uh, not be able to localize the lymph node other than that a tumor location and all that you know you they have not found a huge correlation with the other other factors so what is the indication for a sentinel lymph node biopsy? So when it started off, they said clinical stage one to three A uh, for T3 tumors, of course, the data is uh, limited, but uh, one should not hesitate in doing it in T3 tumors also, I believe, because you would see large triple negative breast cancers who would be T3 and uh, you could still find that the lymph node is negative. So even when you're subjecting such patients to new adjuvant chemotherapy, you should keep in mind the central node biopsy also. So you have to be clinically node negative. So when we say clinically node negative, now we say one, it should not be clinically felt, but radiology is also important. On ultrasound also, you should not have a significant node. Uh, unifocal or multicentric disease, it does not matter if you have multicentric disease because essentially the breast will drain to that node, that central node. Either gender, although you don't see a lot of male breast cancers being treated with central node biopsy in our country, but I have treated three patients of male breast cancer also with central node biopsy and all three were negative. All ages, yes. Uh, previous uh, core biopsy or excisional biopsy is not a contraindication to central node biopsy. So there are some areas where the use is still controversial that like in prophylactic mastectomy, should you be doing central node biopsy? In fact, the only cohort where you can is in that situation where one breast has got locally advanced breast cancer and you're doing a prophylactic mastectomy in the contralateral side. That is when you would do a central node biopsy, otherwise not. So if one has had a previous central node biopsy or axillary lymph node dissection, things can get a bit technically difficult, but it is not as if it is a complete no-no. DCIS, whether you should or not, is again controversial, but high-grade DCIS, and especially if the patient is undergoing a mastectomy, one should go ahead and do a central node biopsy. And even in a palpable DCIS, I would say you should, because you never know, you might actually land up finding invasive carcinoma on the final histopathology. And if you've got suspicious axillary nodes, just bases your a clinical examination or your ultrasound, which says that is a suspicious, you should not deny that patient. I would think that you should go ahead and do a central node biopsy and prove this way or the other. Preoperative chemotherapy, again, like I said, new adjuvant chemotherapy is still a little slow on the uptake, but we are getting data. The complete no-nos are inflammatory breast carcinoma. And if patient is clinically N2, so that is where I come from in the sense that our locally advanced breast cancers, you would usually get N2 lymph nodes as well. So these are the ASCO clinical practice guidelines of 2016. So, and these hold even today that, you know, ideally you should not be recommending axillary lymph node dissection for women with early breast cancer. And if, uh, and they also talk about uh, patients who have one to two lymph nodes positive, you should not be offering axillary lymph node dissection, especially in T1, T2 tumors. Uh, and then if it is early breast cancer with nodal metastasis found in central node biopsy and who will receive mastectomy, uh, you should offer them axillary lymph nodal dissection. <coughs> Excuse me. So multicentric tumors, Moderate strength of recommendation, but it's fine. Multicentric tumors is not a no-no. Ductal carcinoma in C2, like I said, when mastectomy is performed, you should, because you cannot revisit the axilla if a mastectomy is performed and the patient shows up with invasive carcinoma on the final specimen. If the patient has had prior breast or axillary surgery, not a huge no-no, but yes, one must uh, you sh consider um, you know, what uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy in those cases also. And also patients who undergo a reduction ma ma mastopexy, you know, you can still go ahead and do a sentinel node biopsy. Earlier it was contraindicated, but you can. Preoperative and new adjuvant systemic therapy, like I said, the recommendation is still a moderate, but now more and more people are taking it in select cases. But 
those situations where you should not be uh, recommending it, large or locally advanced invasive breast carcinomas, inflammatory breast ca cancers, a ductal carcinoma in C2 where breast conserving surgery is planned and pregnancy. So this is the same thing in a tab tabular form. And uh, this is what you would do uh, clinically node negative at the time of diagnosis with one or two suspicious node, you would still do a central node mapping and excision. Now, if the node is negative, don't do anything further. If the node is positive, uh, positive in the sense if it is micrometastasis, leave her alone, no further axillary surgery. And then I will come to the ACOSOG Z11 trial also, where they say T1 or T2 tumor, one or two positive lymph nodes, breast conservation surgery and whole breast radiation is planned. Uh, no preoperative chemotherapy, all these criteria should be met. If all of these criteria are met, no further axillary surgery. If it is not, then axillary dissection. And suppose you're not able to identify the central node, then do a level one and two um, axillary dissection. Clinically node positive, three or more positive nodes on physical and imaging, or more than T2 and N1. And if no preoperative chemotherapy is given, go ahead and do an axillary dissection. Do a central node only if this fulfills the criteria of Z11. But like I said, Z11, one to two nodes positive only. And if preoperative chemotherapy is given, axillary dissection for residual disease uh, based on examination or imaging, only very select cases where nodes are clinically negative, which essentially means also imaging then you may consider it. But like I said, I still don't do it after new adjuvant chemotherapy. <clears throat> so let us come to, um, we know that it, this is an established standard of care now. And uh, compared to uh, axillary dissection, the staging accuracy and the oncological outcomes of central lymph node biopsy are absolutely comparable in terms of the oncological outcomes with axillary dissection. But the morbidity is another story because morbidity is much lesser with central node biopsy. So this is what we, these are the situations which I've already mentioned in which we would want to do a sentinel node biopsy. So how do you plan for a central node biopsy? Like I, like I said, you have to be, it is both imaging and clinical, invest, clinical examination. So axillary uh, ultrasound may be of use to visualize the axillary nodes prior to definitive surgical staging. So axillary ultrasound will allow you to visualize the lymph nodal size, shape, contour. All this will give you an idea as to whether this is a benign node or is it an involved node. If the patient is confirmed to have axillary nodal metastasis on pathology, whether it is an FNAC or a biopsy, axillary lymph nodal dissection is still recommended. If, however, the axillary nodes are morphologically normal and the cytopathology is negative, please go ahead and do a sentinel node biopsy. So look at this lymph node, very well, uh, you know, very regular kind of a lymph, regular margin, and it's very smooth. And you can see the hilum there, the fatty hilum there. This is a normal looking lymph node. And contrast this with this lymph node, which is uh, very, very rounded in appearance, has got uh, the cortex is kind of irregular and it's, uh, the, it is eccentrically thickened to one side and you cannot see the fatty hilum, which is completely effaced and replaced by tumor. So you must, uh, this is basically theoretical where we talk about lymphocentigraphy. So when we do a lymph node mapping, we do um, isotope based, uh, radioisotope based uh, mapping, but you don't nef necessarily need to get the films of the, lymph, uh, of the uh, lymphatic mapping, which is the central node mapping done with radioisotope. So we send the patient to the nuclear medicine department on the day of surgery. So it takes, uh, you know, if you have a higher weight of a colloid, you can do it also in the evening prior to um, the surgery. But now we use nanocolloid, which is really small particles, and you inject about 0.5 millicuri of 0.2 micrometer filtered technetium sulfur colloid. That's what we use. And in a, it very quickly travels to the uh, lymph node. And then uh, 
after about say 45 minutes to an hour after injection, you can perform the surgery. The site of the injection can be peritumoral, it could be subareolar, and the uh, injection could be intradermal, subdermal, intraparenchymal. So there has been not much of a difference in terms of where you inject because it will all lead you to that uh, sentinel node. So when we say intradermal route, you have to raise a wheel under the skin and the intraparenchymal route, you would uh, do it in a peritumoral fashion. And for sub areolar uh, route, you would uh, do it under the uh, areola, direct it medially five millimeter below the uh, nipple areola complex. So the intraoperative identification rates for all methods is over 90%, which is quite uh, good. The only thing is when you do an intradermal in injection, you will reach the node faster than you would with an intraparenchymal injection. So that's how you do it. You raise a little wheel. That is the intradermal injection. If there is an impalpable lesion, you can either uh, you know, place the needle alongside the wire or you can even inject it uh, peritu uh, uh, subareolar. So this is how you would inject uh, the, uh, the uh, what you call radioisotope and put it subareolarly or alongside the uh, wire in a uh, non-palpable lesion. <clears throat> so you can, uh, so th this is an interesting uh, thing, which, uh, which is about surgeons of, uh, you know, injecting, uh, giving the injection, uh, intraoperative injection by the operating surgeon in the sub region. And it is pretty safe and effective. And it, uh, in, uh, further, it, you know, the intraoperative injection avoids patient pain, vasovagal events and all that, because you're doing it uh, in the uh, in the theater, and uh, the uh, cost associated with preoperative injections is also negated. One, of course, now like I said, we do not necessarily need a lymphocentigram film in the theater to guide us to the lymph node because we know with experience that the node would invariably be found irrespective of whether you have a lymphocentigram or not. Because if the lymphocentigram says or no node visible, you should not be disheartened because sometimes it takes time for the isotope to reach the uh, lymph node and you will find it. If you were to not find it, it is not because the lymphocentigram is helping in any way. So we, uh, we do a dual technique because we know that dual technique has a higher identification rate close to 95 to 98% as opposed to single method uh, especially when, uh, although now there are studies to show that even methylene group alone uh, with experience is, uh, is able to identify uh, the lymph node in 95% of patients. So uh, this can be done alone or in conjunction with the radioisotope for central node mapping. So it can be peritumoral or subareolar, but like I said, is subareolar and periareolar. So you have an isosulfan blue dye or a methylene blue dye. So as isosulfan blue is very tough to get your hands uh, at. Methylene blue is very easy. You can get uh, you know, sterilized vials of methylene blue. It is cost effective and you rarely ever see any anaphylaxis. Uh, the only problem with methylene blue is if you were to do an intradermal injection, the incidence of skin necrosis is quite high. So you get these marginal necrosis and then you have to deal with it in the post-operative period. Whereas with isosulfan blue, you can get anaphylactic re reactions. I have seen it uh, when I, uh, I've uh, used it in the UK and there were blue hives. The patient had blue hives all over her body. So this is likely related to the fact that this blue uh, dye is also used in many cosmetics, uh, paper and textiles, and the patient has possibly been sensitized to it with prior exposure. So um, a radioactive node has been defined as a node with a cumulative 10 second count of greater than 25. The hottest node is taken into consideration by absolute counts. So you should have a 10 is to one ratio of central node to background. So uh, anything which is 10% of your background is taken as a positive lymph node, as a hot node. And any, uh, so central node doesn't just mean a hot node. It is a hot node. It is a blue node. It is a hot and blue node. When I say hot, it means the count on the gamma counter. So when you put a gamma probe on the lymph node, so there is a count 
So if the primary site is say, it's got a count of 5,000. So 10% of that count in the axilla is uh, 500. So any lymph node uh, of uh, so, so any lymph node of that count will be taken as a hot node. A blue is a visible blue, hot and blue. A node could be hot and blue, which is the usual case. And even uh, any suspicious enlarged node would also be taken as a sentinel node. So if somebody asks you for the definition of a sentinel node, so all these things will be included in it. So that is how you see the, um, you can trace it. Once you put in an incision, start tracing it from the subcutaneous plane downwards and you can reach, this will help you reach the uh, blue node. So you can see these afferent lymphatics leading you to that blue node. So what are the complications? I've already told you, they could be urticaria, blue wheels, fallen blood pressure and all the anaphylactic uh, uh, symptoms that you can get with, uh, with uh, uh, during an anaphylactic reaction. And the, the management remains the same. So you have to go down on the anesthetic agents, fluids, and all those corticosteroids and things. Um, so uh, like I said, um, isosulfan blue, not very commonly used. Uh, methylene blue, just make sure that whenever you inject this dye, you must tell the patient to expect blue color in the urine over the next 48 to 72 hours. So axillary, uh, uh, Complications are reported with ALND and SLNB and axillary radiation, but it is much lesser with central node biopsy as compared to axillary nodal dissection. So I've told you the morbidity that is associated with axillary surgery is much lesser with central node biopsy as compared to an axillary nodal dissection. So uh, one of them is lymphedema. So the rates of lymphedema with central node biopsy is much lesser is less than a 7% as compared to a 20, 25 to 50% with axillary lymph node dissection. So the risk factors for uh, lymph, developing lymphedema is basically upper outer quadrant lesions, post-operative trauma or infection, previous axillary surgery, and there is also a correlation with heavy nodal positivity and patients who have, whose BMI is higher than 30. So seroma can happen and wound infection can happen, but these are very common non-specific symptoms which can be dealt with over a period of time with a couple of aspirations. Uh, incidence of paresthesias is much low, uh, lower with uh, central lymph node biopsy. So we do know that the, we do talk about quality of life all the time and central lymph node biopsy has definitely contributed to improving quality of life um, in uh, patients who undergo central lymph node biopsy. So if you have a patient who's undergone a breast conservative surgery and a central node biopsy, it is actually quite brilliant in the sense that the patient does not have any drain that is coming out of her and she can return to her activities earlier than normal. So what happens if a patient has a positive central lymph node? So this is where the discussion on uh, what should happen if there is a positive lymph node. So we know that if there is a positive lymph node, the conventional training and what we even do today is to do an axillary lymph node dissection. So what we do is we do a central node biopsy, we send it for frozen section, the pathologist says it is positive and we go ahead and do an axillary lymph nodal dissection. But now this is where the ECOSOG Z11 comes in, where they talk about a clinical T1, T2 tumors, uh, N, N0 clinically, but on, uh, on when you see do the central lymph node biopsy, one or two lymph nodes turn out to be positive. And this, patient, this is happening in a breast conservation situation. ACOSOC Z11 is only for patients who are undergoing breast conservation surgery. So if that is the case, that only one to two nodes are positive, then you will not go ahead and do an axillary node dissection. Patients in whom completion axillary lymph node will still be recommended are those who receive new adjuvant chemotherapy, especially in the kind of tumors that we see uh, with a positive sentinel lymph node who has, uh, who has undergone, uh, who's treated with mastectomy. If there are more than three nodes, three plus nodes, three, including three, three and plus nodes will require an axillary dissection. If there is extra nodal extension of uh, the tumor, patients who uh, do not receive uh, adjuvant systemic therapy and is not going to have radiation 
don't do a conservative procedure in the axilla and patients with clinically palpable nodes. So what happens, uh, there is a classic, whenever uh, the, the pathologist looks at the lymph nodes, they will say micrometastasis or macrometastasis. So I do have, uh, you know, I do get two to three patients in whom you have done sentinel node biopsy with breast conservation. And the pathologist says, one node shows micrometastasis. I do not revisit the axilla. That is the only situation where I will not revisit the axilla. And she uh, goes for radiation and that is taken care of. So I'll just go over prospective randomized clinical trials, which gave credence to sentinel lymph node biopsy as the standard treatment for axilla. So the NSABP B32 trial was uh, one of the first one, which randomized 5,611 patients. And this was the randomization. Group one was sentinel lymph node biopsy followed by axillary dissection. The second group was sentinel node biopsy. If it was positive, then axillary dissection. If it was negative, no axillary dissection. So the aim of the study was to understand the long-term contr uh, regional control and also uh, to compare the effect of these two treatment arms on disease-free and overall survival and also compare morbidity and the risk of systemic recurrence in those patients who had pathologically node negative disease. So after about 95.6 months of mean follow-up, there was no difference between the overall survival, disease-free survival and regional control in the two arms. So when central node is negative, no need to go ahead and do an axillary lymph nodal dissection. So that brings me to Z10. That was the second uh, in the series of uh, trials. This was in stage one or two, clinically node uh, negative breast cancer treated with breast conservation, central node, and they did a bilateral bone marrow aspiration also. So if central node was negative, no further axillary lymph nodal dissection was take, undertaken. And uh, this bone marrow thing uh, did not really stand the test of time because we do know that if there are, uh, whatever be the stage, and if there is a bone marrow positivity, it does not augur well for the patient. So the objective of this study was to uh, determine the prevalence and significance of IHC positive micrometastasis in lymph node and bone marrow in both stage one and stage two A breast cancer to determine the risk of local recurrence. And the secondary objective was to determine the morbidity of sentinel lymph node. So this is what was concluded uh, that, uh, of course, when you have bone marrow metastasis, there is a higher risk of death. And, uh, th and this has been confirmed in several other studies also. So if on sentinel node, there is IHC detected micromets, uh, they have no significant impact on overall survival. So then that brings me to Z11 again, like I said, T1, T2, positive sentinel lymph node, but uh, that has to be one or two lymph nodes, anything equal to a more than three lymph node is excluded. And they were randomized to either axillary dissection or no further axillary surgery, but of course, whole breast radiotherapy and systemic therapy. So you know the omission of, uh, so the result of this thing supports the trend that even in one to two node, positive, you can actually omit axillary dissection. So this is what is being done in quite a few centers in the US, but there are lots of uh, criticism to this study also, and it is not adopted uniformly across the board. So that brings me to the Almanac trial. This was a trial that was carried out in, the, um, uh, in, in uh, Cardiff in Wales. So uh, this was performed by uh, Professor Mansell and it compared standard axillary management with central node guided axillary management. That is what Almanac is. So uh, Almanac was uh, an interesting study in, 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 the, in the sense that it was divided into two phases. The first phase was a learning phase in which 15 centers performed 40 central lymph node procedures followed by an axillary dissection. This was more like a validation study for them. And once there was a 90% success rate with a false negative rate of 5%, they were able to enter phase two. So the phase two, uh, it was a two armed prospective trial that randomized patients into central node biopsy followed by ALND or SLNB alone. If the central node was negative, no further surgery was performed. If the central node was positive, then axillary lymph nodal dissection or axillary radiation was done to complete the treatment. So the primary endpoints were axillary morbidity, 
uh, to understand how economical it was and also to look at quality of life. So the overall, uh, you know, it showed an overall improved quality of life in the uh, sentinel node biopsy group. The presence of lymphedema was 5% versus 13% at one year following sentinel node biopsy and ALND respectively. And you found that the drain use, the length of stay and the time to return to normal activities was much better with uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy. So central node biopsy is definitely, definitely associated with reduced morbidity and improved quality of life. So that brings me to the Amaros trial. This is also very uh, interesting and a very well-structured uh, trial where uh, it, it was a, a phase three non-inferioritary trial comparing axillary irradiation to axillary lymph node uh, dissection on a positive sentinel node. So it included about 1400 plus women with clinical T1, T2 uh, disease with a positive central node. And then they were randomized to either axillary radiation or axillary lymph nodal dissection. So after median follow of about 6.1 years, the five-year axillary recurrence rate in the ALND arm was 0.43% and it was 1.19% in the radiation arm. But the interesting thing to see here, but there was no difference in DFS and OS, but the interesting thing is the rate of lymphedema rates, which was significantly higher in the axillary lymph node dissection arm and much lower with the uh, radiation, uh, radiation arm. So I'll quickly run through the internal mammary central node biopsy just to complete this uh, lecture in the sense that uh, we have been through the era of external radi extended radical mastectomy as proposed by Urban et al. And uh, they saw that a lot of inner quadrant tumors were failing in the parasternal area uh, following a radical mastectomy. So they said, let's go ahead and remove the internal mammary nodes also because that was doubted as the culprit. But uh, while uh, ERM does reduce the rate of local recurrence, but, uh, uh, and the, you know, there was no change in the uh, overall survival. So that is why uh, there, there, is, there is an ex a published experience with ERM. Uh, in seven studies, about 4,000 patients have been seen. And this is in some way relevant to the current era of central node biopsy. So what, uh, what has been, uh, what we have seen here is that in internal mammary nodal metastases were present in 19 to 33% of all patients. It was more frequent when the axillary node was also involved than in node negative patients. And it was equally frequent in all quadrants if the axillary node was involved. But if axillary node was not involved, then the inner quadrant tumors presented more frequently with internal mammary node metastasis. So the principal reason, why do we want to do this? You know, why do we want to know what is, uh, which nodes are involved is basically prognostication is very, very important. So the prognosis of patients with metastasis limited to the internal mammary or to the axillary node is comparable. And is, it is intermediate uh, between that of patients with negative nodes and those with both uh, IMN and axillary involvement. So the IMN uh, identification is of importance. Uh, for in those patients who would not otherwise be candidates for systemic therapy. That is those who have negative axillary nodes and the tumor size is less than one centimeter. Lots of time you omit systemic treatment, but if there is an internal mammary node involvement in such a patient, things change quite significantly. So current treatment protocols do not include the IMN and uh, yet we do see local recurrence in the uh, IMN or parasternal area, which happens very infrequently by whichever method of surgery that you use. So uh, preoperative lymphocentigram shows drainage um, only to the, so if the indications or contraindications to uh, this is that uh, the, it shows drainage only to the internal mammary node, or it shows drainage to both IMN and axillary nodes. And if the preoperative imaging, which means whether it is a uh, the uh, CT scan or the MRI or PET CT does show evidence of uh, internal mammary lymph node involvement, or if there is reoperative central node biopsy with drainage to the internal mammary node, then you would not do the uh, central node. So this is how you would uh, want to do if at all somebody uh, is very keen on doing it, but 
the idea is that internal mammary node can be taken care of by radiation also. But suppose the patient were to fail only in the internal mammary node in a subsequent setting, say after three or four years, then you're well within your right to actually uh, remove this internal mammary node. And it can be actually done by thoracoscopy also, but if you want to do an open method, this is how it is done. You, the pectoralis major is separated in the direction and then you of the fibers, and then you expose the intercostal muscles, enter the second intercostal space, and from there on, you can, uh, you can just push away the parietal pleura, and it is found very close to the lying, overlying the internal mammary artery. So that is how you would do a internal mammary lymph node, central node biopsy if you have to. See, entry into the pleural cavity occurs very infrequently, but then you need to have expertise because otherwise you can prank the internal mammary artery and that can lead to torrential bleeding and sometimes necessitating a thoracotomy also. So, um, okay. So if you are planning to do, go ahead with, sorry, I don't know what, just a second, let me just set this right. Doesn't matter. So what I'm trying to say is if you do intend to embark in uh, to do a central node biopsy, you should do it where it is eligible, that is T2 tumors, clinically node negative, and do your own validation, which means at least 30 central node biopsies accompanied with an ankle dissection, establish your false negative rates, and then go ahead with it. So I'm going to just leave you with food for thought, which is basically, I, I'm just going to name these trials. You can all go back and read it. This is about doing central node biopsy in patients after, before and after new adjuvant chemotherapy, this is the Sentina trial, a very interesting trial design where patient is clinically node and negative, undergoes central node biopsies, pathologically node negative or node positive. And if it is clinically node positive, you go straight to new adjuvant chemotherapy. So this arm, if it is pathologically node negative, no axial dissection. If it is pathologically node positive and after new adjuvant chemotherapy, you will go ahead and do a central node biopsy and do an axillary dissection also. If it is clinically node positive, converts into a clinically node negative, do a central node biopsy and axillary dissection. But if it does not become node, neg uh, node negative, it remains positive, straight away go, and do a, go ahead and do an axillary dissection. So um, probably central lymph node biopsy, the, what they found was a better diagnostic method if, before giving new adjuvant chemotherapy. After new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, the central lymph node biopsy detection rates were lower and false negative rates were higher. So almost close to 14.2%. So that is kind of not acceptable. So uh, the important thing, uh, the other trial was the ACOSOG Z1071 trial which says that you know the more number of nodes that you harvest, the chances of false negative also falls. But what they found was the false negative rate was 12.6%. Again, you want to keep it below 10%. So uh, in node positive breast cancer patients, sampling more than two axillary lymph nodes definitely reduces the false negative rates. So uh, like I said, you can do it pre, uh, new adjuvant or you can do post new adjuvant. And these are the pros and cons of doing it. Because if you do pre, pre new adjuvant, obviously you're staging the axilla right and providing prognostic information by documenting response to treatment. And uh, the cons of course is that the patient commits to ALND irrespective of how the response is to new adjuvant chemotherapy. So you land up doing an axillary dissection. When you do a post new adjuvant uh, central node biopsy, you direct a uh, treatment basis the chemotherapy response and you identify those patients with response to chemotherapy and spare them an axillary lymph node dissection. However, there is some uncertainty regarding the initial nodal status. It's always good to know what the nodal state, the status was before starting treatment. And of course you get higher false negative rates. But now you have a term called targeted axillary node dissection. I've not mentioned it here wherein you can clip the node which was positive 
uh, prior to starting new adjuvant chemotherapy and then wire localize that node along with sentinel node biopsy when you go ahead with surgery after uh, NACT and you must remove the sentinel node along with those targeted, um, those clipped nodes also. And then you can bring down your uh, false negative rates to about 2%. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I would like to, uh, if you allow me, I can. I would like to show you a couple of videos. Uh, these are short videos of a central node biopsy. I did not mention the ICG, which is again a new kid on the block, which is the indocyanin green, which can also be used to perform a central lymph node biopsy. And it is specifically true for those people who do not have a nuclear medicine facility. Just hold on, I am running low on my, um, just a second. Yes, ma'am. I'll just stop share. Let me just plug it in, otherwise I'll lose you guys. Huh? Just a second. These are the tuberculin <coughs> syringes, which we use in the um, um, nuclear medicine department to inject the uh, isotope. So that's the that's where the tumor is. So they are doing a peritumoral and a sub areolar injection also. And this is inside the theater where you inject blue dye. So these this is an earlier video of mine where we used to do an intradermal, um, but now you do a sub areolar and a peritumoral. So that's the gamma counter, which is showing a count of about 15,000. So you will run, move the uh, gamma probe up and down to identify the highest point of activity before you place the incision. So when you run it up and down, and you can see that it is almost about 500 plus uh, activity. That's the highest activity there that you're seeing. So wherever you find, you mark that area with your with a little marker. This is just for reference so that you know that's where it is. And now you place your incision uh, and center it on the area that you've marked because that is where it is likely to be. You don't have to make a very big incision. A small incision, which is about two centimeters to two and a half centimeters is good enough. And then you can use the cautery and then you can slowly use these cat spore or any other uh, Retract and you can almost see there, there you can see a little blue tinge coming down. So that is where the uh, blue streak is coming down. That is the afferent channel. And you have to go along that blue track. And this track will lead you to the lymph node. Some people do resort to massaging the breast once you put in the dye just to make it more, uh, to move faster into the axilla. So there you can see the lymph node coming into view. So you put out the probe on the blue node and see whether it is uh, the same node that you're looking for. So you can see the count going up to almost 2000. So gently dissect it. And this is a hot and blue node. See, you can see it is hot and it is blue also. And once you've taken this out, you must run the probe within the axilla again to make sure that there are no other lymph nodes which are uh, also hot and blue because they also need to come out. Take it away from the site of the uh, axilla because you can have shine throughs and, and see whether you're getting the same count when you take it away from the uh, breast because in the breast, you will be having very high count. So you can see that is, that is the uh, video of the... Um, Central node. I will also show you a little video of a central node with ICG, which is the uh, indocyanin green. Oh, where did I go? Okay, let me show this to you. So indocyanin green, you're using ICG and you use 0.5 ml. So if you're doing the right breast, you will inject it intradermally at 12 and nine o'clock on the right side. On the left side, it'll be 12 and three o'clock. So you do it periareolar. So this is where is the 12 o'clock and this is the right breast. So that is where the injection is. And this is called the spy mode. 
where it is white, it is shining. And this is the green overlay mode. There are three modes to it. And this is the color segmented fluorescence mode. And if you want to reach the lymph node, you can look at the spy mode and see the track because it happens almost instantaneously and see where it finishes off. That is where your lymph node will be. So you make an incision where the track ends and then uh, use the gamma pro because we were doing it as a, as a one-off case and we use, you, you have to use blunt and sharp to get to the lymph node. And this is the track and you can see the lymph node coming into view there. That is the lymph node there on the spy mode. So now you gently dissect it off. And I will show you again, show this uh, on the uh, color segmented as well as the green overlay mode. So that's the color segmented. The red portion is the lymph node. And this again is the spy mode. And this is the green overlay mode where you can see the lymph node. So that is how it looks on the ICG uh, central node biopsy. Right. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, if there are any questions. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. If, if there are any questions, you can, of course, ask me. Yes. Uh, ma'am, the ICG which you just showed, so do you always like look with a camera? Means, uh... So this is a this is an ICG thing, you know. So ICG has is a, is a camera based thing. So you have uh, this camera which can pick up the fluorescence in the infrared uh, uh, part of the spectrum, and uh, that fluorescence is what leads you to the lymph node. So we don't use this method. I use the isotope with the blue dye method. But there are some uh, hospitals in the country where they are using ICG also. Okay. So do I use SLNB for T4, A, B, C? No ways. See, we must always be very, very cognizant about the kind of patients that we treat. Uh, it is all good to follow the West. I'm sure they give us a lot of base principles on which to base our practice, but we must understand that we have to tailor make it according to the needs of the patient. But even in the West, they do not recommend a central node biopsy for a T4B or a T4C lesions like the ones that we see here. Uh, Ma'am, in your presentation, uh, one slide you mentioned that uh, it gives a wrong reading on the pulse oximeter when you do. Uh... Yeah. So methylene blue, you know, is known to be uh, known to make sign methemoglobin, no? So you can actually see the uh, pulse oximeter show a lower reading, which is actually a false uh, false reading. It is just that it is combined with the hemoglobin and does not uh, allow you to get the right uh, reading. And also, ma'am, uh, you mentioned about hives uh, developing in the patients, blue hives. Yes. So, yes. So how do you manage that patient? The same as any other anaphylaxis. Is it instantaneous or is it a day? So I, the, the patient okay. that I remember when we had shifted her out of the theater into the post-operative area. And then of course the nurse was shifting her out and she saw that, you know, she had these blue wheels all over her body. Uh, but in those days, you know, when I was in the UK, there were no smartphones. So I could not really click a picture of SAB. consent, her ka consent So, you know, I don't have pictures of that, but yes, she had blue hives all over the body. Yeah. But it settled down on steroids and the usual. Uh, you know, uh, Abel and um, hydro, uh, hydrocortisone, she settled down. So I've been asked how many nodes do I generally remove in central node biopsy? See, the uh, standard thing is uh, not more than six nodes. If you take out more than six nodes, it does not constitute a central node. So the usual is uh, three to four nodes is what we usually remove. Uh, so in, in those we label uh, the, um, hot and blue nodes as uh, the sentinel and we call the enlarged node which we come across as the non-sentinel. Yeah. 
in chemo naive patient and post new adjuvant so my post new adjuvants are very restrictive in the sense say i have a largest uh, breast lump uh, and the patient is very keen on conservation and uh, suppose she is a triple negative 2 and 1/2 cm tumor and there is nothing in the 2 and 1/2 or 3 cm tumor going in for a new adjuvant chemotherapy primarily because she's young and she wants the braca and all those things done then i would do an ultrasound guided fnac of the lymph node which i do for most patients and if it comes back as negative then i will note down in her uh, prescription that this patient will come in for a central node biopsy even after a new adjuvant chemotherapy so only in those situations otherwise my use of central lymph node biopsy in locally advanced breast cancer is nil i would not do it till i validate my own uh, thing you know own uh, patients yeah then one thing i wanted to ask about the pathological nodal staging so in uh, pn0 there is a category of isolated tumor cells uh, does so is it found on sentinel lymph node because in pn1 there is a uh, a uh, uh, found on uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, mm. also but what is about uh, isolated tumor cells okay. can you please tell me so isolated tumor cells is is uh, does not impact your treatment management at all so if i were to say isolated tumor cells or i were to see micrometastasis it will not change my management at all uh, in fact even for radiation so radiation now the new uh, thing is that you know even if you have one node positive you would go ahead and give radiation but uh, with uh, isolated tumor cells or micrometastasis you don't need to so it does not have clinical significance in that sense and like i told you even for my decision making if i if like i said we do uh, frozen sections for our central node biopsies and the pathology says negative we don't uh, we close and come back and the final pathology says or oh, there were isolated tumor cells in the central node on paraffin section or there were uh, micrometastasis it will not change my decision i let the patient be especially if she is uh, had a conservative surgery we will just have radiation in that patient and if the same were to happen in a patient who's had mastectomy so if her tumor character is good her uh, if, if it is a good biology tumor i would still leave the patient alone i would not revisit the axilla so ma'am is there any use of this uh, staging of pn0 i plus and also uh, can you please also comment about pn0 uh, molecular plus which is rt pcr detected so and also how is it done so i am not possibly the best person to answer this because this is something that the pathologist can best answer so although this has come into our staging and i'm sure it has come into the staging primarily because you know i'm sure we have we'll get more future directions from these things uh, but uh, as of today it does not have major implications on the way you treat your patients Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, 